The Weldon Railroad was one of the last important supply lines for Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army besieged around Richmond and Petersburg during the last winter of the Civil War. In December 1864, Union commanders U.S. Grant and George Meade ordered a massive raid of over 20,000 men to destroy the railroad all the way to the northern North Carolina border. What began as a straightforward military strike by the troops, including uh, Erie, Pennsylvania region's uh, 83rd PA volunteers, deteriorated into a vicious foray against the local civilian population, fueled by copious amounts of confiscated whiskey. This was followed by a brutal retaliatory murders of isolated Union stragglers. The militia cycle then escalated into the burning of wide swaths of civilian homes and the wanton destruction of foodstuffs. It was war at its most brutal level. Historian George Deitch will explore this little known action, often uh, from the point of view of local Erie soldiers uh, who participated in the raid. Hello and welcome to a special program, a partnership between the Hagen History Center, the Erie Civil War Roundtable, and the Jefferson Educational Society. I'm Ben Spagan, I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Before we get to a fuller introduction of our presenter and his presentation, a few programmatic reminders. Uh, since this program is first airing live on both the JES and the Hagen History Center Facebook pages, we'll work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comment section below. If you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, still reach out to us, send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going. And of course, for more information about upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, do visit jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information on the Hagen History Center, please visit eriehistory.org and find them on the social platforms too. Now to introduce our guest. Uh, he is no stranger to the JES digital stage and digital programming and this partnership between the Hagen History Center and the Civil War Roundtable. Uh, you may know him from his presentations on the Civil War and Erie history, or on the Cuban Missile Crisis, or on corrupt and contentious presidential elections, and or you may know him as the executive director of the Hagen History Center. Mr. George Deitch has co-founded several historical organizations related to the Civil War and the War of 1812 in Erie, Pennsylvania. He's also helped create the flagship Niagara League, which played a central role in reconstructing the U.S. Brig Niagara and creating the Erie Maritime Museum. He's a prolific presenter and has published in numerous journals and served as a consultant to National Geographic Magazine for its Civil War Susquehannock issue. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. George Deitch back here for this program, uh, for this partnership. George, thank you for joining us here. Thank you, Ben. Um, as Ben mentioned, and as you can see the slide, uh, this is a uh, can be a pretty uh, brutal tale of the Civil War. You know, we tend to look back 150 years, 160 years, and glorify war to a certain degree, um, you know, fighting people fighting for their uh, freedom, other people's freedom, people trying to maintain their own, own way, and. Um, it, uh, it had a lot of dark sides, which um, are not as well published or uh, popular. And this is one of those. Uh, this came out of a paper that I read um, in 2007 uh, to the Society for Military History's annual conference. I came across the story and I uh, will talk about how I did that a little bit later, but um, it fascinated me. Um, when I discovered a diary of a local uh, soldier who really laid this out and being a Civil War student for as many years as I have and, and writer, um, it was something that I just didn't know anything about. So I started to dig, um, I presented this paper uh, at the Society for Military History. And then uh, later I published a, an article in Civil War Times in 2009. Um, and uh, so I, I'll, detail some of that later if anybody has a question on where to look for more information. So Ben mentioned the Weldon Railroad. That was the key supply line, one of the two key supply lines for Robert E. Lee toward the end of the war with his army in Northern Virginia besieged around Petersburg and Richmond. And this talk examines a military expedition that was carried out by the Army of the Potomac's Fifth Corps late in that war. The expedition, which was officially designated as the Hicksford Raid, 
took place in early December of 1864. Um, its objective was the destruction of the railroad link. Um, and uh, it was uh, unexpectedly, the raid deteriorated into uncontrolled violence and destruction, even though the clear military goals uh, did not include the systematic devastation of civilian property, which by the way, had become more common as federal policy toward the end of the war. This convulsion of brutality was unique to the Army of the Potomac and to the annals of the entire Civil War. The talk will scrutinize several important questions. What circumstances led to this situation? What actions occurred and how widespread was it? And why did it happen? The commander of the Fifth Corps was Major General Governor K. Warren, a conservative professional soldier. The Corps itself had no previous history of wanton destruction against civilian targets. Even two years earlier at Fredericksburg, it only had minimal involvement in the looting of that old colonial city. The Army of the Potomac, which was the principal army of the uh, federal government in the East, generally had avoided the guerrilla warfare that plagued other Union armies. When, while Union soldiers often supplanted their rations on the march by foraging at nearby farms for livestock or firewood, that was different from what happened in Sussex County, Virginia that bitter December of 1864. Some of the Union perspective in this study comes from the soldiers of the 83rd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, one of the elite units of the Fifth Corps, recruited in Northwestern Pennsylvania, primarily in Erie County. Um, the 83rd was one of the longest serving units in the Army of the Potomac, participating in every campaign since March of 1862. By the fall of 1864, the 83rd was much reduced uh, by combat and expired enlistments. As a result, at the time of the raid, only about 200 men mustered for combat service out of an authorized complement of 1,000. By the end of the war, the 83rd held the tragic distinction of suffering the second highest number of casualties of any Union regiment in the entire war. The situation of Petersburg in 1864, it had been uh, three and a half years of combat. The war was much different than it was in the spring of 61. Gone were the days of idealism, limited warfare, and the protection of enemy property rights, which included slaves. Attitudes had hardened on both sides. The results of the November 1864 election, of a re-election rather of Abraham Lincoln, showed that voters in the Union firmly rejected the peace platform advocated by the Democrats. Even the army voted in the field for the first time in US history and had voted overwhelmingly um, for Lincoln, rejecting its Democratic candidate, the beloved ex-commander, George McClellan. Um, the attitude within the ranks reflected a grim determination to finish the war. The recent overland campaign during May and June of 1864 had produced the most sustained and costly fighting between the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia to date. That campaign was followed immediately by the protracted siege around Petersburg. That city was the vital, was vital as key to the capital, Confederate capital of Richmond, 20 miles to the north. Four out of five of the railroads servicing the region ran through Petersburg. Unable to destroy Lee's army north of Richmond, Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant and the Army of the Potomac crossed the James River on the night of June 14th out flanking Richmond. Grant initiated a series of direct assaults on Petersburg, but failed to capture the city. He then changed his strategy and began a 10 month long siege, um, but failed, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, pinning down General Lee and his army in a static defense of the Richmond Petersburg area. Grant's new strategy was to hold Lee in place while extending his trench lines southwest and later from a point starting directly east of Petersburg. This would ultimately cut all the rails into Petersburg, thus forcing Lee to abandon uh, that city and the capital. Grant launched a series of uh, offenses throughout the summer and fall of 1864, aimed at the rail and road network. Each gained some ground, but none of them proved to be decisive. All of them proved to be bloody. By then, the Fifth Corps units had endured six months of trench warfare and served in several major battles around the Cockade. Early in 1864, while the men of the 83rd settled into their newly built winter camp, 
Union headquarters at City Point, Virginia was tense with activity. General Grant, who is the commander in chief of all federal armies and his staff were planning coordinating campaigns on several fronts. Uh, Grant was especially concerned about the situation outside Nashville where Major General George Thomas and his army of Cumberland confronted the aggressive Confederate General John Bell Hood and his army of Tennessee. Meanwhile, Major General William T. Sherman, his army was advancing uh, rapidly approaching the Georgia coast cutting a 60 mile swath of devastation after leaving Atlanta in flames. At the same time, an amphibious operation to capture the major port in Wilmington, North Carolina, which was protected by Fort Fisher was being organized at nearby Fortress Monroe. With winter nearing, Grant was anxious to deal another blow to Lee. This target was the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad, which connected Southeastern Virginia with North Carolina. It remained a crucial supply conduit for the Confederate Army around Petersburg, even after the Union victory at the Battle of Globe Tavern in August, which cut the railroad near Petersburg. Confederates had continued to run supplies along the railroad to Stony Creek, about 20 miles south, and then hauling the rest of the way by wagon along the Boynton Plank Road. Grant wanted this traffic broken up. With the return of the Sixth Corps, after victories in the Shenandoah Valley, Grant could strike the Weldon Railroad without weakening his siege works. His plan was, quote, to destroy as much of the railroad as it would no longer be practical for Lee's commissar to run a wagon line to the end of the track. Accordingly, on December 5th, Grant issued orders to Major General George Meade, who was the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Now, as I go through this story today, especially when I get into what the soldiers are saying, I'm gonna be reading a lot of quotes because I really want you to understand um, their point of view, not me telling you what the, uh, their point of view was, but hearing what they had to say. Um, Grant's order to Meade, you may make immediate pref preparations to move down the Weldon Railroad for the purpose of effectually destroying it as far south as Hicksford or farther if practical. Hicksford was almost at the um, uh, North Carolina border. Send a force of not less than 20,000 infantry, 16 or 20 guns, and all your disposable cavalry. Six days rations and 20 rounds of extra ammunition will be enough to carry along. Under previous understanding with Grant, Meade selected General Warren's and reinforced Fifth Corps to conduct the raid. Warren's force would travel light and fast, as few encumbering wagons as possible. Meade's order to Warren delivered on the 6th was explicit and detailed. You will be prepared to move down the Weldon Railroad tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning at daylight or soon thereafter with a force hereafter mentioned, striking the railroad below Stony Creek and effectually destroying it from that point to Hicksford if possible. The force under your command will be the 5th Corps with Mott's division of the 2nd Corps and two brigades of cavalry, the latter under Brigadier General David Gregg. The order went on to specify the exact amount of artillery, wagons, ammunition, rations, animal forage to be carried on the expedition. That same day, uh, Meade wrote of the uh, importance of the upcoming raid. Um, in a letter to his wife, he wrote, tomorrow I send off an expedition under Warren, which I trust will result in something decisive, as we are all anxious to have matters on a more settled basis than the uh, than they are now before the winter. When the orders reached the soldiers of the 5th Corps, the men of the 83rd Pennsylvania complained furiously about giving up their newly constructed winter quarters. Quote, we had built the winter quarters on the people's farm in November and had hoped that we would be allowed to remain there during the winter, but our hopes were somewhat dashed one evening on receiving orders to be in readiness to move at an early hour the next morning as we would probably be relieved by the Sixth Corps. Swearing was indulged in frequently, as you can well imagine. This is a, a drawing by one of the soldiers from the 83rd Pennsylvania that he sent home to his parents called Our House. That's what he was complaining about leaving. Reports of the movement had been around since the previous Sunday when Sergeant Daniel Foote of the 83rd wrote to Julie, his fiance. And now you'll see a series of slides with the pictures 
as the men are speaking. Um, uh, Foote would write, marching orders came in tonight. I don't know how long we may be, so I decided to write this evening. The Sixth Corps has arrived here. We've received orders that on the morrow, the Sixth Corps will take our houses at the works by our firesides. I'm glad it will be this noble brave corps that is going to enjoy the fruits of my toil. If it had been the Ninth Corps, I should have been tempted to fire my shanty. Now, those of you who are Civil War buffs know exactly where Dan Foote was coming from. Um, he would uh, then write, what a life soldiers lead. Two hours ago, the men were enjoying all the quiet Sabbath evening with full expectations of enjoying many such Sabbaths, Sabbaths by the same firesides, but now they relieve us. Where are we going? One says we're going to cut our way to Sherman. The others say we're going to Weldon of Wellington. When Colonel Charles Wainwright, commander of the Fifth Corps Artillery, was informed about the upcoming raid, he made the following entry in his journal. The sixth is to relieve this corps. It is very hard on our men who have just got their huts completed. They have to turn them over to others and build afresh themselves. This is kind of an interesting photograph. It's the only one in existence of Wainwright, who was a rather prominent uh, soldier in the Civil War. I believe it's a post-war. And um, I've looked and looked and no one has anything else. So we've got this kind of guy with the weak chin and the big mustache, but not in uniform. Typically camp was rife with rumors and whenever troops prepared for uh, movement. Foote wrote on the fifth in his diary, marching orders, what a hurry in camp. No one knows where we're going. The order merely says, be ready to leave tomorrow at dawn. Part of the Sixth Corps landed at City Point, direct from the Shenandoah. I have an idea that we're going to go back on reserves somewhere in the rear of our lines, ready to support any part attacked. But I may be mistaken. Time will tell. Well, the next morning, the soldiers, still not knowing what was coming next, moved from their camp toward the rear, um, holding near Fort Stevens. Foot would continue the next day in his diary. This morning at daybreak, we were in line with everything ready for the march. Having been relieved from our comfortable winter quarters, you can see there's a continuing theme about complaining about losing their winter quarters, and sent away to find new homes. We marched directly to the rear, um, bearing to the right uh, when we reached the Jerusalem Plank Road, where we uh, bivouacked, where we bivouacked after four miles. The whole car arrived after dark. We have no orders uh, relative to building camp, and I think we're going to go somewhere. That evening, he wrote, be ready to march at 6 o'clock a.m. is the order. 60 rounds of ammunition is to be made up in rations for four days. And we quietly laid down to rest upon Mother Earth with a prayer for God's protection through the coming moon. Um, throughout his diary, which is um, a very interesting foot, um, often shows his deep religious convictions. By now, Colonel Wainwright was uh, better informed of the purpose of the, uh, of the march. Um, he writes on the 6th, uh, we, that is the 5th Corps, to move tomorrow at uh, morning at daylight. It's a mere raiding expedition for the purpose of destroying the Weldon Railroad so far south from Stony Creek as to prevent Lee from drawing any supplies from that direction. General Warren will have command in addition to all the infantry of his own corps. He's to have Mott's division of the 2nd, Gregg's division of cavalry. This will make him strong enough to hold his own against any force that Lee is likely to send against us should uh, he attempt to interfere. The speed of our movement will be our main reliance for success. I am to take but four batteries of four guns each along. Foot on the next day will write, Reveille sounded at 3 a.m. At four o'clock, strike tents was sounded. At six, we we're underway, filing south on the Jerusalem Plank Road. Mail came this morning for the last time during the movement. And it brought me a letter from the dear one in the North, full of kind, cheerful thoughts to cheer me through the coming task. We marched directly south until we were between 10 and 20 miles from Petersburg, when we turned right and came to halt on the banks of the Nottoway River, waiting for the pontoon train to come up as to Bridget. We lay there until 10 o'clock, expecting to move at any moment, when we received orders that we'd not march until 2 a.m. It rained almost the whole day, making it very slippery marching. But tonight, the sky became clear, the stars shone brightly. So we wrapped ourselves in our overcoats, lay down, take four hours rest, 
with nothing but the stars to guard us, save he who notices this arrow fall. In contrast to Foote's comments on the weather and marching difficulties, others recalled uh, milder weather and a pleasant march at the beginning of the expedition. What could account for that? Well, the march line was probably between 12 and 20 miles long, so you may not have had uh, rain in every spot the whole day. This man is rather a uh, uh, military looking figure, is uh, Brigadier General Regis de Trobion. He is a former French army officer and was now a commander of a brigade in Mott's division. He wrote, the weather had become more mild. It was one of those autumn days in which it is pleasant to march and the spirit is, is exuberant. We turned our backs on Petersburg, which was not unpleasant to us. We advanced into a country in which the marks of war showed less and less and which had a charm of novelty to us. Um, Wainwright wrote a rather lengthy uh, entry for the seventh and also he recalled good weather. And even to that veteran officer, the march was intriguing and almost romantic. I'm, um, I'm cutting down the size of his long uh, entrance, but he said the head of the infantry uh, reached this place, Freeman's Ford, about two hours before the dark. Cavalry had crossed by the Ford and one brigade of infantry had found itself over in the same manner. As soon as the pontoons were got up, they began building a bridge. It was a canvas boat train, the laying of which being new to me, interested me much. The frame on which the canvas is stretched is very simple and easy to put together. The whole packing when taken apart into a small compass. I was too surprised to see that the weight of these boats would hold up and how little water passed through them through the canvas. The bridge was very quickly laid is one of the, and then he would go on to say, it is one of the romances of camp life. The soft night air, the tall leafless trees under which we bivouacked which stretched all along the south side of the river. The wide plain on the opposite bank, the bridge lighted up by great pitch pine fires, the noise of the men, horses and mules all contributed to make a picture as if one dreams of. So even these hard bitten soldiers um, still maintain a bit of romanticism in, in their writing. I'll mention a little bit more about this pontoon boat. Um, the pontoons mentioned by Wainwright were a new type. He'd not even seen them before. It was canvas over wood frames rather than the heavier cumbersome wooden boats. The wood frames could be quickly set up and the canvas would be stretched across. In about an hour, Major Martin Van Brocklin and his 300 man detachment of the 50th New York engineers assembled two bridges of over 150 foot each. Um, it took them less than half that time to disassemble and pack them up for the next crossing. And all the Corps marched about 15 miles before crossing the Nottoway. Confederate scouts soon observed the, mo the movement of nearly 27,000 Union troops. When Lee heard the news, he telegraphed the Confederate Guard units along the railroad, as well as Major General Wayne Hampton. He said to Hampton, the Guard units were warned to be on alert, and the Cavalry Corps is ordered to scout the Federal force and find out its route and destination. Characteristically, Lee ordered a counter-striking force under Lieutenant General A.P. Hill to move out from Petersburg to attack the Union Raiders. During the previous August, Hill and Hampton had mauled a similar force of the Second Corps at Ream Station along the Weldon Railroad. This is the route of the march. Um, you can see Petersburg near the top and all the way down to the very bottom where Hicksford, Belfield, and the Marin River was. And um, again, you can look at the days that it took to get down there and get back. We'll talk about more of that as we go. On, on Thursday, December 8th, uh, Foote would write, at 2 a.m. this morning, attention was sounded rousing me with the rain pouring down on me. Again, a bag and baggage was hooked and buckled and we we're plodding through the mud for the river. We crossed the river and reached Sussex County Courthouse, a distance of six miles at daybreak when we halted for breakfast. The clouds have broken away and a cup of coffee down. All are in good spirits again, criticizing the country, 
the style of buildings and everything else, typical soldiers. Sussex County, although foot would go on to write, Sussex County is quite a pleasantly situated little village surrounded by a fertile, level, beautiful farming country with many handsome farmhouses surrounded by a cluster of Negro huts, um, which are to be seen throughout the country, the county. Um, a storehouse full of supplies was discovered here and given to the flames. At eight o'clock, we fell into line and pushed on in a southwest direction. The soil being sandy, the road soon became dry, and we had a pleasant march. Now and then the division of cavalry ahead of us would get into a little skirmish, but the opposition was very slight. We halted for supper about a mile from the Weldon Railroad and the men as they came in with chicken, turkeys and mutton, fresh pork, um, as we had orders to forage, fell into cooking earnestly as, we, as earnestly as we had marched. Two hours were thus pleasantly spent when the bugle call sounded attention again and forward march, so uncoiling, we reached the Weldon Railroad about 8 p.m. We stacked our arms and the work of destruction commenced. Uh, this is again going from foot. He would say, the road was torn from its base and turned over by then by means of levers. The ties were pried from the rails and piled up crosswise, well mixed with fence rails then the iron rails were right, laid across the top and fire was set to the piles. Thus formed the heat causing the iron rails to bend nearly double. Thus the work went on till midnight. It was a grand sight to see 40,000 men thus at work. Foot exaggerated this by about double. Um, as far as the eye could see to the rear, fires burned up brightly giving the sky a bright warm color and it needed for the air was bitter indeed. At midnight, we filed down to the woods and lay down to rest, having done a long, hard day's work, and as men usually do, having marched nearly 20 miles. Some could, still could not sleep until a cup of coffee had been made and drank, then to bed in dreams of home. The march between the Nottoway and the railroad totaled 18 miles. During the pleasant weather on the 8th, many Union soldiers foolishly sh shed their heavy coats and equipment. Um, behind them for miles, the roadside was littered with abandoned overcoats, extra blankets, knapsacks, and similar things. Many of the foot-weary and fatigued infantrymen had lightened their loads. They would live to regret it because the next day the weather turned cold and stayed cold for the remainder of the expedition. The 83rd lost its first man during the raid on the 8th, probably captured while straggling. Um, by the 12th, Hugh Do Doherty, from Dan Foote's Company C was confined in Richmond's Pemberton prison. Greg's cavalry was the first to approach the railroad at Jarrett Station, where as mentioned by Foote, the first real skirmish in the raid took place. Um, uh, Mrs. W.W. Uh, Jarrett would later report five of the enemy, obviously Union, were killed and buried at the High Hills churchyard. An officer of the 83rd Pennsylvania reported some additional detail about the destruction on the 8th. This is Lieutenant Edward Willsley, um, shown here as a Sergeant Major. He said, at sundown, our division uh, moved to the railroad and destroyed it as far as Jarrett Station, 10 miles from Stony Creek. At midnight, we were relieved by the 3rd Division who continued to destroy the track while we bivouacked. Wainwright observed that the suffering of the war had brought even to this relatively untouched part of Virginia, describing the plight of a six person family who lived in a home where he camped that night, foraging Union soldiers had already killed and eaten the last two large hogs on the farm. Wainwright would say, everything showed the poverty of the inhabitants, even though the house was a large one and the builder no doubt at the time thought himself pretty well to do in the world. Now the white part of the household were evidently all living in one room. All they had to live on now for the coming winter were three quarters of a barrel of wheat flour, some dozen bushels of old corn. They've suffered badly from the three raids, including this one through here the past season, which all of their growing crops were destroyed. The whole of their livestock was killed. The little grain above mentioned and some eight or 10 very young pigs running about is all they have left with no money to buy more. The ninth mark, uh, marked a major change in the character of the expedition. 
while the destruction of the railroad continued, serious combat took place at the railroad bridge over the Marin River at Hicksford, 10 miles south of Jarrett Station. Later that evening, a volatile mixture of pillage and retaliation fueled by confiscated liquor exploded into a kind of violence never uh, before perpetrated by um, the soldiers of the 83rd or their 5th Corps comrades. Um, this is a, a picture, obviously, of, of soldiers. Um, this was drawn by a uh, man on the expedition um, who is showing, um, and this is a cavalry man, um, showing, uh, chasing down the livestock of a, uh, of a homestead of a farm. Foot would write, all day the work of destruction went on, and at night we went into camp. About 30 miles of the railroad had been completely destroyed. We encamped about five miles from Belfield, um, which is just uh, north of Hicksford. Our advance had been uh, our advance had been engaged in quite a warm fight during the day. The court says um, uh, Belfield was captured. That afternoon and evening, sleet is falling fast, forming ice upon our tents. Men. Um, among other forage, have discovered a supply of liquors upon a plantation about five miles distant. I doubt there being over 200 sober men in the brigade. Singing and shouting and fighting is the order of the night. It makes me homesick and tired of soldiering to see all these noble men make brutes of themselves. A little after midnight, I got up for the third time to drive drunken men away from the fire in front of my tent, when one of my comrades, himself about half intoxicated, got mad at some remarks making by the drunken fellows to me, went in and knocked three of them down, some of them twice apiece, who then crawled off to bed, leaving us quiet. Our objective is accomplished. Um, they say in the morning we start to return, having penetrated 50 miles into Rambledon. The infantry mustered at 6.30 a.m. on that Friday and began their destructive work at first light. General Gregg's division, which had burned the bridge across the Nottoway, several miles um, south of Jarrett's on the previous day, rolled south to destroy the railroad bridge run along the Mirror River. Um, he ran into a hodgepodge group of Confederate defenders commanded by the talent in Hampton. Besides a division of Confederate cavalry um, who had raced around the Union column to reach Hicksford by daylight, his forces include some garrison infantry quickly summoned from North Carolina, accompanied by several companies of underage junior reserves, plus nine cannon. It's the old men and the boys coming out to defend the ground. Hampton ordered some of the infantry to dig in north of the river. Um, he planned to check the Union advance there in order to give time for AP Hill with his pursuing infantry column enough time to catch up and possibly trap uh, Warren's entire force. Later in the day, Warren and Wainwright rode up to assess the situation at, uh, in at Belleville. And um, Wainwright recorded in his day after a small attempt to get down to the railroad, it was given up as likely to cost more loss of life than it was worth. His fire cost Greg some 20 or 30 men. Warren reluctantly uh, concluded that the day's delay to take and destroy that bridge would jeopardize his entire expedition. So we're, if you look at the map, we're at the very bottom of the map um, where that cavalry fighting took place. I got a, uh, a slide behind here. David Gregg um, is on the left. Wade Hampton is on the right. Meanwhile, the infantry continued their work, tearing up and burning the railroad. After each division finished its destruction along their part of the line, they would leapfrog the next division, moving south and commence the work again. Lieutenant uh, Winnesley rode home. It was a fine sight to see the line of fire for 10 miles. By the afternoon, the soldiers neared exhaustion from hard marches and exertion to destroy the railroad. The weather uh, began to turn even more miserable, and the falling temperatures turned the heavy rain into sleep. When the men broke from camp, they sent out parties uh, for, uh, to the nearby farms for livestock. Notwithstanding Wainwright's earlier com comments, the troops found this area 
of Sussex County to be rich with provisions. At the same, same time, slaves from the area began to flock to the Union camps seeking freedom. Widdlesley's observation for that evening was fairly typical. At night, we bivouacked on the plantation of one Ben Bayless, who had a lot of Negroes, poultry, grain, etc., which was all appropriated. We had about 20 barrels of whiskey called Applejack. Our men got a hold of it, and many of them were soon drunk. Applejack, by the way, is a, is a very potent form of apple brandy, also called Applejack whiskey. That night, the normally disciplined uh, troops of the 5th and 2nd Corps turned into a drunken, unruly mob as more units discovered that Applejack was produced and stored in large quantities throughout the area. Some depredations against the civilian population actually started even before the whiskey was found. In the letter home, Colonel Robert McAllister of Mott's division mentioned the burning of the homestead of one Reverend Bailey, who was an unrepentant secessionist who had a large plantation and cotton stores. This occurred during the march to the railroad. Another Second Corps writer reported, no special order having been issued against pillaging and the devastation of private property. There was from the first of the march straggling for that purpose. On the second and third day, this was carried out to a shameful extent. Every house within sight and some far beyond being visited. Although the troops were amply supplied with food, the houses were ransacked and stripped of everything edible while women and children wept in their prostrations. The whiskey fed uh, breakdown and discipline spread this behavior and set off a tragic chain of events. Numerous residential, re regimental histories, excuse me, letters and diaries recount the consumption and effects of Applejack. Amos Judson in his history of the 83rd Pennsylvania wrote that almost every man in the brigade filled his canteen and coffee pot. And by midnight, we had a drunken brigade. Things quickly got out of hand. The disorder reached such an extent that a regiment of cavalry was sent in to suppress it, but the cavalrymen too were overcome and only added to the uproar. You can imagine 25, 27,000 armed, drunken soldiers. It, uh, it got very ugly. The plunder of the surrounding homesteads intensified and several rapes even occurred. Color was no barrier. Both black and white women were victimized, including one in advanced pregnancy. One soldier even pinpointed a union officer accused of this crime. Quote, during the night, Colonel Edwin Biles of the 99th Pennsylvania and his adjutant were perpetrating one of the foulest outrages on two defenseless women whose house was within our lines. Those women were compelled to submit to their infamous proposals or have the house burned down and themselves turned out in the bleak December. Had this been the work of privates, said privates would have suffered death. But old Biles is an officer and was drunk as is his custom. The escalating uh, pillage reverberated throughout the night. Reacting to the Yankee deprivations, depredations rather, a number of locals as well as roving bands of Confederate cavalry began to retaliate. Some Union stragglers who were caught were summarily executed. Meanwhile, scouts from Major General Matthew C. Butler's cavalry, by the way, who was a nephew of Oliver Hazard Perry, um, were, quote, instructed that when they caught Yankees in the act of robbing and burning, to take the vandals by the arms and legs and swing them into the flames, drunk or sober. Such are the terrors of war. By morning, most of the army was in no shape to march, but necessity found, forced Warren to push the troops. A.P. Hill's corps was rapidly approaching. Had Hill moved aggressively to cut across Sussex at Jared Station instead of swinging south through Hicksford, the expedition would have been in serious trouble. Hill missed a golden opportunity. Foot short diary entry for the day recounted what happened next. March to Sussex Courthouse, distance of 21 miles. This morning we started on the back track. It proved a hard day's march to me, being ordered to stay and get all the drunken fellows of the night before started. After an hour, the task was accomplished and I had to make up um, 
with the column had started ahead of me. We took a new road reaching Sussex Courthouse a little after dark where we went into camp. Some of our stragglers being found with their throats cut and bodies stripped, orders were given to burn everything. So our path was marked by fire and smoke. Caught of the spasm of violence were two members of the 83rd, both too drunk to march out of camp. James Flynn, a native of Ireland, had been with the regiment less than a year. He was sent to Pemberton prison and paroled in March of 1865. A man of good health, Flynn was mentally broken by his imprisonment. He became, quote, insane by reason of the said service in Company A, the 83rd Pennsylvania, and being a prisoner in Libby prison. He suffered mental problems for the rest of his life and was confined to insane asylums from 1870 to his death in 1903. Another man was uh, lost was German immigrant Louis Schilling, also of Company A, um, who had enlisted uh, the previous February. He disappeared and was never found again. Um, he was his mother's sole supporter and she supplied for a survivor's pension after the war. An affidavit written to support the claim said that the 83rd was retreating from the enemy, the said Lewis Schilling being from some cause unable to march was abandoned in the, on the field. I thus th saw him abandoned and not heard from him since. The enemy at this time was heavily pressing our rear. Their firing could be distinctly heard um, the next, uh, at, at the next time and said Lewis Schilling was so left in abandon. Um, another affidavit said he was unable to stand upon his feet or walk, so he was abandoned. No prisoner of war record exists for Schilling. He certainly died at the hands of the pursuing Confederate cavalry. Um, Private George McGee, of the, uh, also from Company C, was captured on the 10th. His service record gives no indication regarding the circumstances except that it was on this side of Belfield, the last documented casually from uh, the 83rd of the raid. Um, more units suffered more. McGee did survive the war. Many other units separated from, uh, many other Union soldiers separated from the command and most likely drunk or ambushed. Quote, they killed them and mutilated their bodies. The dead were stripped naked, their throats slashed from ear to ear and then were hung by the side of the road where the returning column could see them. At Sussex Courthouse, the bodies of a half dozen nude Union soldiers were found placed side by side at the courthouse. A murdered Union soldier was discovered pinned to the ground with a stake driven through his mouth. Enraged, Union troops escalated violence, escalated their violence. It's unclear who gave the orders to burn the civilian homes. Warren in his official report claimed that he tried to stop it as did several officers. In all probability, these acts were spontaneous. Some officers participating and others looking the other way. Many accounts mention the bodies at the courthouse, but comparatively few claim to actually have seen them. Rumors were rife and the numbers cited ranged from two to six. Nevertheless, the discovery spread like wildfire down the line of march and the command became a destroying host as it moved back northward. This war was um, far from typical of the type of warfare of those Union soldiers. It was a more callous violence against civilians, against their property. I have a whole page of quotes of various soldiers um, who um, are uh, commenting in letters and I won't read them all, um, just a couple of them here. This discovery had a peculiar effect on the soldiers. Either with or without orders, they began to burn and destroy everything within their reach. Another one, in retaliation, our men um, uh, are returned burnt almost every house on the road. This is a hard sight. Um, where fine buildings stood, we, uh, when we went down, only chimneys now stand. This is a new kind of warfare to us, but all feel although it was just. Not all Union officers were so sure of that justification. The chaplain of 120th New York expressed his revulsion. Such savage atrocity, which was the murder of the Union soldiers, cannot be too severely punished, but a wholesale and terrible retaliation 
for the most part upon the innocent and helpless for acts as wicked as they were, um, were uh, incited by wanton outrages of our men could not only be but bad lessons in morals to the troops. Brigadier General Joshua Chamberlain, who commanded a brigade on the raid, expressed his frustration. This is a hard night. I saw sad work in protecting helpless women and children from outrage. I invariably, invariably gave them protection, which every man of honor will give any woman as long as she is a woman. But I have no doubt they were all burnt out before the whole army got by. It's a sad business. I'm willing to fight men in arms, but not babes in arms. Wayne Ray composed another long entry in his diary, um, praising his own troops for their discipline. But he said that although there is great provocation against the Union soldiers, it is not enough to justify your acts at all. Um, he said, it is so pitiful of a sight as the women and children turned adrift at nightfall, a most severe night too. I never saw before and never want to see again. If this is a raid, deliver me from going on another. The miserable weather um, made the return march even more difficult. General uh, de Trevion wrote in a letter home on the 14th describing the conditions. During the night between nine and 10, the snow changed to ice. And during all the following day, we marched on the ice and found in, in, in frozen landscape. I never saw anything like that. There wasn't a blade of grass, nor a leaf, nor a branch, which wasn't covered by ice a quarter inch thick. It was curious, magnificent to see, but hellishly cold. As, day, as the day warmed slowly, slightly rather, the troops found themselves marching in icy ankle deep mud. When Warren arrived at the courthouse, he ordered a stop to the burnings. He later mentioned only one instance of the soldier with his throat cut, but acknowledged it soon became a belief of all the men in the command. Every effort was made by the officers to stop um, the burnings, um, which likely, most likely punished only the innocent, but only with partial success. The Confederate victims long recounted the humiliation by federal troops who burned their furniture, homes, and crops, then left women and children in the snow with no food or animals. It was finally the darkness, heavy cold rain, and exhaustion that stopped the burnings. Back at City Point, um, both Grant and Meade were very concerned about uh, having no communications from, um, uh, from Warren. Uh, they sent a division south to meet Warren. Um, Warren's men met that division and sent them back home saying, we'll find A.P. Hill had broken off his pursuit. On the 11th, Warren's troops made another, another physically difficult march back towards the safety of the Petersburg Lions. Um, the Confederates, I mentioned, Hill never caught up, and Hampton's cavalry broke, uh, broke off, harassing the rear guard as they crossed the Nottaway. Foot would write, the courthouse and village were burned this morning. We crossed the Nottaway River and reached about a mile toward Petersburg on the Jerusalem Plank Road. Um, our commander, uh, General uh, Joseph Bartlett, who you see there in the picture, um, and his staff rode around quite a flock of sheep drove them up to our brigade and called, rally around the sheep boys. In about five minutes, none were left for others and we had plenty of mutton. Um, uh, so that was uh, the men in spite of their problems actually ate quite well during the raid. It's unclear how much damage was actually done to the civilian property. By some accounts, it appears that hundreds of homes were destroyed. Many of the soldiers on the march certainly believe that. But the Sussex County Land Book for the records of 1865 only showed 28 homes with lower assessments for damage due to the raid. And I really think the reason for that is it was a sparsely populated rural county. Everything was burned in their path, but there were only about 30 plantations, taverns, et cetera, that were in the way. Um, uh, General de Trovion would write, we have burned about 30 plantations and taverns besides barns and uh, forage in retaliation for our stragglers who were murdered. Although Foote and many others believe the courthouse was actually burned, 
The original mid 19th century uh, building still stands. A few beams in the attic are charred, but um, as I when I went went up to uh, the attic, um, I could still see blood stains um, on the second floor in the attic from soldiers hospitalized there. Um, about 12 years ago, when I visited, uh, the county clerk stated that while many of the records were bor burned, the majority were hidden away before Greg's cavalry had slept, swept through. Two uh, books that were left behind that I had a chance to see um, were, are still at the courthouse today. One was almost cut in half by a Union saber slash. The other has graffiti on it written by a Union officer. It's kind of an interesting bit of graffiti. He says, this indenture was made, and remember this is an official courthouse book, this indenture was made on the 11th day of December in the county of Sussex, Virginia. Know ye all people that this is the case that there will be one more vigorous and well-directed blow against the existing rebellion while she is struggling in the last throes of her expiring agony. And then he writes, oh fiddlesticks. And he said, signed by the commanding officers of the cavalry. Another relic of the ransacked courthouse is the original solid silver county seal, which is about this big from 1864. It disappeared during the raid, but it was mailed back to the county in 1901 by the former commissary sergeant of the 40th New York, who had, quote, accidentally required, acquired it, um, as he said in his letter. The seal and the letter are now framed at the clerk's office. Um, there would be multiple letters from home that I was able to find and uh, letters to uh, local newspapers to Erie, uh, Foote, Wittlesley, Chaplain Clark amongst them. Um, they, uh, uh, they talk about the severity of the march. Um, they talk about uh, thanking God for their safe return. Um, most of them made little or no mention of the uh, murders or the burnings. And that didn't really start coming out until later. Um, uh, matter of fact, Chaplain Clark, who was actually not on the expedition, wrote a letter to his son um, mentioning that there was a superabundance of Applejack. And he said, uh, some stragglers were gobbled up or killed, several found belonging to the cores with their throat cut. Um, they tore up 10 miles of railroads, he said, um, but says um, uh, that the uh, raid was a great success. Later, later uh, newspaper reports uh, will start to come out near it, saying that all buildings were burned, making a line of march for two miles each way <clears throat> with flame and smoke. Um, so what is the aftermath? Well, first of all, only Warren in his official report as a corps commander mentioned any of the killings and burnings. Um, none of the other officers involved who wrote official reports, um, even brought the subject up. There are no recriminations for the deprivations and within days, army life returned to normal, the men of the 83rd and the rest of the 5th Corps. Um, this was far different from the reactions of two earlier situations when organized Union field combat units pillaged and burned uh, homes on a large scale um, before it became uh, uh, the order from Sherman. After Athens, Alabama was sacked in May of 1862, a court-martial convicted Union Brigade commander who was a former czarist officer from Russia um, who had shut my eyes, as he put it, for two hours, encouraging the deprivations. His division commander was transferred to a backwater. Uh, later on, um, interestingly enough, though, both Stanton and Secretary Warren Lincoln uh, promoted uh, uh, Turchin to being a uh, Brigadier General in spite of the widespread controversy. When Fredericksburg was pillaged two years before, a new ideological fierceness aimed at the Southerners had begun to evolve, but most believed that the vandalism, uh, which was directed primarily at the wealthiest homes in town, um, was hence presumably, who were hence presumably the most uh, virulent secessionists. However, many units refused to participate in the pillaging and soldiers, um, were actually, uh, or the provost marshal was actually ordered to confiscate uh, things that had been stolen from those homes. But by the end of 1864, there's virtually no public comment in the North and disciplinary actions were, were not taken against the offending soldiers for their 
um, deprivations against the civilians in Sussex County and their property. What happened? Um, the raid severely damaged the Confederate supply system. Um, throughout the winter, thousands of Confederates deserted to Union lines with tales of little food and inadequate clothing. clothing. Thousands of others simply slipped away, returning to their homes. The Weldon had been the Army's principal source for animal fodder, so the cavalry and the artillery suffered especially. Days after the raid, the Confederates started repair on the tracks. General Hampton placed General Butler in charge of work with a thousand of his own cavalrymen. Butler rebuilt about six miles of the line in two weeks. And the railroad superintendent impressed about 300 slaves to continue the work. Um, it wasn't until early March that the railroad was opened all the way from uh, Weldon to Stony Creek again. And, uh, but this was an operation for only a brief period before the events of Petersburg led to the abandonment of the whole line. Um, another um, situation, although I'm not sure how it actually would have affected the Confederate supply system was that um, over 100 slaves um, escaped to the Union column and made their way back to the safety of Union lines and freedom as a direct result of the raid. Casualties, um, we know that there are approximately 200 uh, infantry and 135 cavalry um, on the federal side, including 225 missing. These were stragglers who were either killed or um, uh, sent to prison. Um, and the Confederate casualties went unreported, both military and civilian. A little bit about causation. The whiskey backed, uh, or the whiskey fed breakdown of military discipline led to unchecked murder and rape. Brutal retaliation followed um, by the locals and the Confederate cavalry. It became a vicious, cycle of violence. Um, there are several historians uh, whose views of um, uh, military interaction against civilians are uh, uh, pretty interesting. James Pearson um, would write, the central component of the masculine code of honor was revenge for insult and injury. Hatred of the object of vengeance was often accompanied by this code. As the Civil War escalated in scope and intensity, the fear of hatred and revenge against the perpetrators of death and destruction crowded out Christian charity. Um, another would write, Union soldiers trapped in such a landscape, surrounded by civilian population, half of it hostile, all of it bizarre, felt tremendous anxiety. It felt the fear and the fear led to rage and it gave rise to seeing that the enemy that threatened him in almost every time was not the regular Confederate soldier, um, but the irregular, the partisan, the guerrilla, the man who did not abide by the rules of war, the man who pretended to be a civilian, the figures indistinguishable from the Northern landscape. The Union soldiers felt surrounded and always under surveillance and potential attack. The frightening they out there became everyone but themselves. Under intense and continuous pressure, they gradually lost more of their ability to discriminate between guerrilla and civilian targets. So how, how do we go? What is the conclusion here? Well, it's a, certainly a dark chapter in Civil War history. It was a unique for the extent of the breakdown of the military order and the num um, number of troops involved in uncontrolled violence against civilians. It's a little known action. Um, again, officially the raid was nearly unrecorded and is rarely included in any modern histories. Warren and his subordinate commanders deserve a lot of credit for the military success of the mission and effectively extricating the raiding force after the events on December 9th and 10th. And that concludes my presentation. Um, and uh, Ben, I know you probably have a question or two and I'll be happy to uh, to uh, answer them. George, I, I just first want to thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, so much history to cover in, in, in such a short span. So well done, sir. We appreciate that. Shining a light on a dark chapter in the Civil War 
and a relatively unknown uh, chapter of the Civil War. And I want to go right back to that beginning. Uh, you, had, you had started to tell the audience uh, at, at the start of your, your presentation, uh, you became interested um, in doing this and you did a talk uh, for a group and then it turned into a, a paper that you had published in, in Civil War times. What got you hooked once you started researching this and that you wanted to unpack this more? What was some of the drive for you to really spend time uh, taking a look at um, a chapter that didn't get a, a lot of attention until you've come along and, and helped us understand it? Well, I, I'll say um, I had read the history of the 83rd Pennsylvania uh, more than once um, over the years. And again, barely much of a mention of that it wasn't until I, I came across Dan Foote's diary, which is at the, uh, uh, which at that time was the Military History Institute in Carlisle, Center for uh, uh, Military History for the Army. And um, um, when I read the diary and he was so explicit in so much, I said, man, I've got to learn a little bit more about this. So I started searching and I found other letters from men from Erie. I went back uh, looking for uh, diaries of other people on the raid. Um, uh, Wainwright, I, I discovered his uh, journal and uh, which is now, which has been published. But I just kept finding more and more and more information, even though there was almost no um, official mention of the raid and certainly not of the burnings and killings. Um, so about, this, and, uh, about the same time I, I did the article for the Civil War Times, Another article was published by a friend of mine, uh, uh, historian Chris Calkins in Blue and Gray magazine. It's called the Applejack Raid. And I don't have the, the volume, um, uh, but um, it was published right around 2009 also. Um, and Blue and Gray magazine including a driving tour. So if you ever get down to Southeastern Virginia and um, you have a copy of that you can actually follow the course of the raid. Um, my article came out um, in Civil War Times, volume 48, number six, and that was December of 2009. And I mentioned um, the lack of modern work. Uh, you know, large volumes on Petersburg um, will have a paragraph or maybe two. The only book that really um, had anything of any length, and I, I did find it as I was doing my research many years ago, was a, uh, a book called The Last Citadel by Noah Trudeau, uh, same last name as a Canadian prime minister. He devotes a whole chapter to it. And really, other than uh, my article and Chris's article, uh, this is the only book uh, that is out there that has anything of any consequence trying to tell the story. So it still remains a, um, uh, uh, an unknown chapter. And, and I thank you for that, because you, you, you answered my next question, George. I was going to say, where else do we go? Because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of source material for that. So we appreciate you pointing us in the direction, number one, of, of the piece that you've written and, and the other pieces. I'm going to echo a couple of comments here in the comments section. One says, thanks, George. Great work. Another says, very interesting topic and great presentation. Thank you. I say the same thing. I do uh, want to take one of the audience questions. Uh, you know, we, we can't get through the 83rd. Uh, talking about Erie, Pennsylvania, without wondering about one of our own, perhaps, uh, Strong Vincent. And, and here this person is wondering, was, was the 83rd Regiment uh, uh, the, that regiment that produced uh, General Strong Vincent? Uh, so, George, can you give us a little Strong Vincent here before we sign off tonight? Well, you know, I've done a, a full hour and a half lecture for you, Lunch. I know. I think that's what they're asking for, George. So that's what we're going to have to tee up next and one of these to come. So, yeah. Well, so, yeah, uh, the 83rd produced Strong Vincent. Um, he was a pre uh, uh, militia, a pre war militia um, uh, adjutant. He was the, um, uh, he, he uh, was in the first regiment out of Erie, which was the uh, 90 day regiment, McLean's regiment, would uh, go into the 83rd as its lieutenant colonel, uh, would rise to its command, would rise command of the brigade, which uh, consisted of four regiments, including the 83rd and would be mortally wounded on Little Round Top, which was July of 1863. So a year and a half later, uh, this raid takes place. Um, after Vincent's uh, demise, there had been um, four more commanders of the 83rd. And um, I actually wrote an article for another journal 
about the struggle for command after the death of Vincent. Um, but uh, you know, he is, for people in Erie, he's kind of the pillar of the 83rd, although John McLean, the founder of the regiment, who General McLean High School was named for, um, is, uh, was key to the, uh, um, uh, to the recruitment of Union soldiers from Erie. Well, George, I think you just queued up another presentation we could do, the 83rd after Strong Vincent. I love that idea as well. Uh, I think there's so much to take away from this, uh, this presentation. For me, certainly the brutality of war, uh, the horrible things that can happen uh, during a time of war, uh, and the enormity of that, and then perhaps our, our not shining a light uh, on that um, for, for many, many years, and until thanks to you uh, calling this to our attention and, and talking about this dark chapter, um, you know, and I, I think about that too, of, of how we treat our history and how we learn it. Uh, I know you went through a wonderful conclusion slide there, but final question on the doorway out, George, I'm gonna ask you, if folks are to take away one, maybe two things from today's presentation, what do you hope they walk away with? Well, First of all, I'm, I'm glad I was able to tell them about something they probably have never heard of before. It reflects both um, a military success story, but if the military does not hold its discipline, um, and we saw this in Iraq, um, we have seen it, you know, with many in many other countries, um, with a with a less disciplined military. Um, if, the, if the soldiers are not held to account or if, they, if the discipline gets away from them, war, which is hard enough, can turn brutal and can um, uh, go well beyond uh, what you uh, consider military necessities, uh, destroying homes, destroying civilians. And so we always have to be aware that um, that, that real tough edge between military necessity and uh, discipline. Um, if it slips, um, any soldier is liable to, uh, or any group of soldiers are liable to slip into something much darker, much more brutal than, than um, we like to think. And I think acknowledging that and, and taking the time to learn that part of history uh, is so critical. And I can't thank you enough for uh, helping us learn that part of the Civil War. I'll say one more comment here. Thank you so much for the great presentation. That's in the comments section. Uh, Mr. George Deitch, historian, author, and executive director of the Hagen History Center. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time, energy, and efforts on this research and sharing it with us here in this pre pre presentation, a partnership um, between the Erie Civil War Roundtable, the Hagen History Center, and the Jefferson Educational Society. Thank you, George. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ben. And of course, to all of you watching along at home, whether you're tuning in live, uh, watching on the JES Facebook page or the Hagen History Center Facebook page, or catching a later broadcast of this, uh, streaming it on demand, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us here for this program. George, for folks looking to connect uh, more with you and the Hagen History Center, as well as the Civil War Roundtable, uh, where do we point them? I would say the easiest thing to do is go to our website, eriehistory.org, eriehistory.org. And um, you can find an email for me under staff, or you can ask a general question, which we'll get. Fantastic. Thank you, George. And uh, folks, for more information about both upcoming programs and past discussions available now for on-demand on streaming, uh, head over to our website, jeserie.org, jeserie.org. Uh, there you're also going to find a wide range of publications from timely reads on current topics to reports, essays, and more. And of course, be sure to find uh, the JES and the Hagen History Center on all of the social platforms you know and love. Facebook, uh, like us there, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, on behalf of the Erie Civil War Roundtable and the Hagen History Center and for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.